Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Versi. I'm going to share my screen up. Okay. So I'm a um, senior scientist within the lab of Professor Serge Schwiemus at the hospital in Geneva, and I'm working on a simultaneous EG and fMRI. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, analysis of brain networks. Um, in uh, more detail, I will talk about EEG and fMRI connectivity, then a little bit about graph analysis, and finally how we can combine EEG and fMRI in a very basic way. So the idea of today's talk is to assess how the brain communicates uh, across uh, several regions in multiple scales uh, by using the so-called functional connectivity which um, takes uh, dynamic brain rhythms in two brain regions and then calculates the statistical dependencies. Normally you would do this over 10 to 20 minutes, but then again, um, uh, you can quite variate this. I will talk about this later. And this functional connectivity does exist, as we heard yesterday, because there exists a the so-called structural connectivity that we can measure with uh, diffusion MRI. Um, and we measure the number of fiber bundles we have between two brain regions. When we want to measure functional connectivity, we can both use EEG, MRI, but we can also use MEG. So everything I'm talking about today from EEG side also applies uh, most of the time to MEG. Um, so the basic idea is that um, I split up my brain into um, into um, different regions, and then I can get both uh, a simultaneous signal of my EEG and my fMRI. As we heard yesterday, the EEG signal is taking the, the electrical activity on the scalp, while the functional MRI is getting a little bit more complicated, as you can see here, uh, down here. But the basic idea is that uh, once we have um, oxygen uptake from the brain activity, we get the so-called uh, a bolt signal, and we can see this in our magnet resonance scanner. And then here you can look this up down in the reference here if you want to know more details about this. To make this a little bit more illustrative, you can also imagine the brain being some kind of a city map and the, uh, the brain activity is are the cars that uh, navigate across this map. And then you can build of this um, city, you can build um, the connections, the streets between different hubs of the city. And when we apply this to the brain, uh, what we've seen yesterday, the diffusion MRI is uh, kind of counting the number of lanes we have on our city roads. Um, the fMRI, as I said, it's a kind of a measure of oxygen uptake. So it's kind of measuring um, the, the gas that the cars are taking up at the um, gas station. And finally, the EG is measuring a really coarse signal on the top of the city, uh, which is kind of the, the, like the smog that we get from the cars moving through the city that we then need to reconstruct. So you can see directly what are the problems of the different methods. And you can also see that when we want to measure the brain non-invasively in um, humans, we have really limited methods. We're not directly on the single neuron. So that's the basic idea of today's talk. Um, so when we're measuring EEG, we have a really good um, 
temporal resolution of one milliseconds, while when we're taking functional MRI, we take one or two seconds to get a whole shot of the brain. And finally, what we heard yesterday, uh, we can also use tractography at a good resolution of three millimeters or better. And the idea is to project this all into the same atlas to build connectomes from the structure and the function uh, and transform this into a connectivity matrix where each dot in this matrix signifies the connectivity strength uh, between two brain regions. So today I'm gonna focus only on the EEG and the fMRI uh, part of this. And uh, the questions I want to address today is, what kind of tasks can I use? What kind of pre-processing do we need? I will focus only on fMRI as we heard about EG yesterday. Then I will um, talk a little bit of the different atlases we can use. And I will give a rough overview of our connectivities and basic properties of the graph. So we, went, we need to decide first what the subject does when we put the EG cap and uh, I will uh, today differentiate only between two things. Uh, one task is to do resting state. So basically the subject is told to do nothing and we can uh, look at the brain activity when doing nothing in the scanner or we can give the, the subject a task. And I guess today there's a presentation later on this, how to use um, functional connectivity in a task. For the resting state, um, this is normally the um, most commonly used when we derive functional connectivity. The session length will be around five to 20 minutes. When we're using EG, we can uh, get uh, shorter periods because we uh, measure much faster frequencies, but for the fMRI, we really need to do at least five or 10 minutes because we're looking at the infra slow frequencies there. Uh, but at the same time, we need also uh, to keep in mind that uh, we don't want any mental state changes in the resting state. We don't want the subject to fall asleep. We don't want them to get nervous or, and start moving because this will all introduce artifacts on our resting state signal that we don't want to know about most of the time. I will, uh, there short note on the fMRI because we talked only on EEG yesterday. So normally what you would do in the fMRI is to um, correct for motion. So you need to realign the volumes that you're taking at each second or two, and you need to realign it across your 20 minutes um, recording. Then you would uh, do a so-called slice timing direction. So when you take uh, one volume of the fMRI, in one second, of course, the first slice of your um, of the head you're taking is one second before the last slice that you're taking in the MRI. So you need to uh, correct for this um, time delay. Um, then what you sometimes do is to crop for uh, physiological measures like um, the heart beating or breathing. And finally, what you would normally do is to regress out um, the white matter, the CSF signal, and sometimes also the gray matter signal. Um, for the EEG, I won't uh, get into details today as we talked about this yesterday. So when it comes to atlases, we have uh, two basic choices. So we can either take an anatomical atlas or um, a functional atlas. For the anatomical atlas, uh, the advantages uh, are that um, we can really get a template for each subject that also works for all subjects. Uh, so one of the first atlases was the Taliak atlas, which is not used anymore normally for uh, brain imaging. There's um, the AAL atlas, which has been used a lot of time, which maps basically the anatomical volume 
on to your brain. This is also used less right now because normally you would now switch to a solution based on FreeSurfer, which tries to map the individual anatomical surfaces of the individual brain um, scan. And uh, when we talk about connector mapper, um, uh, we can also use the Lausanne Atlas, which you can see here, which is a subdivision of this um, surface-based um, atlas in FreeSurfer. So the good thing is that uh, when you do those anatomical atlases, you will get the same label for all subjects, more or less. Um, sometimes there's a problem with highly variable node size because uh, the thalamus, of course, has a different size than the visual cortex. Um, this can be mediated, for example, in the Lausanne Atlas by using kind of the higher parcellations where the regions get um, kind of the same size. Um, but another problem is that um, when we think of resting state is that um, functional activity is not um, uh, strictly linked to the um, anatomical landmarks. And um, one of the concepts here is the so-called default mode network. This is the network that um, activates when uh, subjects are doing nothing in the scanner. And those kind of networks uh, exist in every subject, but they can uh, also uh, variate um, where they're located exactly in the brain. So, so this is the second choice we have. Um, from the anatomical atlas, we can also define it from a functional point of view uh, directly on the fMRI. And here I'm putting um, an example of the most widely used uh, functional atlas, the so-called GEO atlas, where we map um, several uh, networks like the visual network, the motor network, and uh, the default mode network that I just showed you. So there are different options now here for those kind of functional atlases. Some of them, they just subdivide, for example, the Yale atlas into smaller atlases. Um, others are, are based on, um, on meta-analysis of uh, big data sets. Um, still, here you have the problem that you're mapping one atlas on a template uh, onto the individual function. And if you really want to get um, an atlas for each subject, you can also use ICA, where you extract from your functional activity of each subject um, how uh, those uh, different uh, brain networks map exactly into your specific subject. Yeah, that's a thing you need to um, keep in mind when you're choosing the atlas, but um, uh, both all of the options have um, specific advantages and disadvantages. So once you have the atlas, you now can go and um, average your activity inside the atlas. We saw yesterday how this uh, works in um, EEG when we do the search reconstruction. For functional MRI, normally we have a voxel time course in each region that we can average and then uh, take um, some statistical dependency. For the fMRI, you would normally use Pearson's correlations, but uh, sometimes people are also using partial correlations or mutual information. This will normally give you an um, undirected graph for fMRI. You can do directed um, <laughs> connectivity in fMRI. And for EEG, I think we will talk about this later today. Um, for fMRI, you can do it. But as I said, you only get one um, brain volume at one sec or two seconds. So it will be different, difficult to uh, derive any um, temporal dependency to, to extract a temporal um, dependency. And the thing I want to um, stress here today is it's really important to think about the connectivity that you're using, because here I'm showing, for example, if you use um, uh, phase coupling or amplitude coupling, this might give you different re uh, results. And what you can see here is that um, uh, network A and B 
are phase coupled while uh, um, network A and C are amplitude coupled. And you can see that um, both phase and amplitude coupling can exist independently or at the same time. So that's uh, the, once you selected Atlas, the next choice would be um, to think about your connectivity you want to use. And then for the last step, you really uh, made it and you can now take your connectivity matrix and take those raw values or create a binary matrix to construct a graph of the brain. And here I'm just getting into um, some simple um, measures that are normally used uh, that can get more difficult, but then uh, you can look this up in the reference below. So basic um, graph uh, properties that you can use is for example, the degree where you just count the number of connections to each region or the cluster ring co coefficient where you just uh, look how central uh, a node is located in a specific cluster. Uh, another concept is also taking the path length. So you look in your binary graph, how many hops do I need to get from A to B? With this, you can then derive uh, more uh, complex measures and what has been discussed in the last 10 years or so, or less so now, is the so-called small worldness. This is the idea that the um, brain is optimally uh, segregated, um, but also integrated at the same time. So we want to have uh, functional clusters of the brain that uh, at the same time can connect to the rest of the brain to communicate. And the idea here is when I have a regular graph, um, my, my activity is really local, but when I want to com communicate to uh, another part of the brain, I need a lot of hops to get there. At the same time, in a random network, I have really low uh, path lengths, but at the same time, I, I don't have any specific clusters where I can specialize functionally. And the idea of small world really is that I have something regular, which clusters in some regions, but at the same time connects to the other clusters. And you can uh, calculate this by using both the clustering coefficient and the path length. And this has been discussed quite widely in the literature. Another thing you can just do is to use the spatial correlations of your connectivity matrix and um, compare this across uh, subjects or um, modalities. So this brings me to the idea to, so I just showed you that you can do the graph both in EEG and fMRI and optimally you want to uh, get both the information on the EEG and the fMRI. So you want to have this fast um, temporal resolution on, of the EEG, but also the good uh, spatial resolution of the fMRI. You can just visually inspect this and compare this, then the next uh, complexity level would be to overlay this. Um, I will show an example later. Then uh, the more complex um, applications, I think we will talk about some of them today, is to do some kind of asymmetric fusion. So you would, for example, use the fast information of the EG at the sub-second level and inform your functional MRI or your structure about this. Um, this will then give you, of course, a, a high level of information. Um, so that's that. Uh, at the end, I will just uh, do a really uh, simple <coughs> example of uh, data integration. So we're, we're not fusing anything here. We just put the EG and the fMRI into the same atlas, and then we, we choose to, to, to use some connectivity measures, in this case, imaginary coherence or Hilbert envelope correlation for the EG and Pearson's correlation for the fMRI. And what has been shown in several papers now, both for MEG and EEG, is that those connectivities um, correlate across uh, both EG and fMRI. So, uh, it has been shown now that um, you kind of measure the same thing when you're looking at connectivity, which is uh, a good signal, I guess. 
Um, as the question came up yesterday, if this works for several scanners, I put also a little slide where you can see that this correlation between EG and fMRI that we are extracting from concurrent EG fMRI recordings uh, exists across all uh, scanner setups if you're using 64 or 256 electrodes. Um, but you can still see that this correlation is not perfect. So it's 0 0.3. So there's also a lot of uh, noise and uh, complementary information between um, um, both modalities that uh, need to have uh, further investigation, I guess. To come back to the atlas, um, uh, of course, when you uh, do a, a such type of uh, data integration approach, um, uh, you are projecting everything into the same space. So you will uh, lose your fast temporal resolution of the EG because you're averaging um, across 20 minutes or 10 minutes of resting state recording, but you will also lose the, um, the spatial um, resolution for your that you have for the fMRI, but you cannot use for the EG because you have only 64 electrodes or less. And what you can see here is that the correlation between EG and fMRI, of course, is, it's much higher when you kind of find a space that both modalities can work with. And this, um, this is why this is only a data integration approach and like fusion approaches would um, uh, work on solutions that um, fuse really the fast temporal resolution and the spatial resolution into one space. So that's uh, more or less what I want to talk about today. I hope I convinced you that um, can be interesting to look at the brain from different spatial, topological, and temporal time points. And when we want to understand the brain, I, I would argue that you need to look at several modalities at the same time. Here I put you some resources, for example, the connector mapper, but also um, some basic stuff to do graph analysis on your brain graph. Um, and some further reading if you want to. With that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. And I'm, if you have questions, feel free to ask now.